tonight on CBC Vancouver News. This new information reinforces the need for a thorough investigation into this matter. New evidence suggests the plane that crashed in Iran killing 63 Canadians was brought down by a missile. I can't believe that some people would do that to their own people. Shock and anger from relatives and friends of the crash victims and... It was really hard to see that my granddaughter being cuffed. They just wanted to open an account. So why was this grandfather and his granddaughter handcuffed at a Vancouver bank? Good evening. It is shocking new video that appears to support what multiple U.S. and Canadian intelligence sources are now saying. That the Ukrainian International Airlines plane that crashed in Iran was shot down by a surface-to-air missile fired by Iran. The video obtained by the New York Times appears to show the moment when the missile hits the Boeing 737, which had just taken off from Tehran heading for Kiev. There's a small explosion, as you see, but the plane stays airborne, a fireball, and then another explosion when Flight 752 crashes. All 176 people were killed, including 138 passengers traveling to Canada. At a news conference in Ottawa today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau suggested the Iranian missile launch might have been an unintentional act. The news will undoubtedly come as a further shock to the families who are already grieving in the face of this unspeakable tragedy. It, it's a tragic thing when I see that. It's a tragic thing. Uh, but somebody could have made a mistake on the other side, could have, could have made a mistake. Mistake or not, no one on board survived. At least 14 of the passengers are from B.C. And while their families are still grieving, some of that grief is quickly turning to anger. As Tina Lovegreen reports, the Persian community here is grappling with news the crash could have been caused by their own country. A steady stream of people paying their respects to the owner of Amir Bakery on Lonsdale. His wife and 18-year-old daughter were killed in the plane crash. I just dropped off some flowers and said a few words to myself. It's a terrible incident. Did you know that? No, but it's sad. But the community's grief has quickly turned into anger, with news the plane was likely shot down by an Iranian missile. We, we don't want to believe because it's so... Uh, it's something that you can't even imagine. I, I wish it's not true. I wish. I'm shocked and I don't know how to react. And I'm just... I can't believe that people... Some people would do that to their own people. Sudabit Halebian says she's filled with sadness, hurt and anger, asking why so many young lives were lost, potentially because of politics. Travel agencies are scrambling, trying to find a way to get victims' families to Iran so they can get answers. But major airlines have rerouted or cancelled their flights. And today, a Lufthansa flight to Tehran rerouted an hour after takeoff from Frankfurt leaving those desperate to get their loved ones with few choices, either wait or go through a complicated journey. And we don't have much option. Uh, Qatar Airways is still, you know, from Tehran to Doha, um, Doha, Montreal, Montreal, Vancouver. <clears throat> so we don't have much airline. So um, lots of them, they have to get out of the Iran with airplane, except Istanbul, they have a border, they can go with a bus. With so many challenges ahead, this man says, the only remedy is love. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, North Vancouver. And we will have much more on the tragedy of Flight 572 coming up during this newscast.
In reports tonight, a U.S. government civil rights watchdog is investigating what happened at the B.C. Washington border last weekend when dozens of Iranian Americans were detained and questioned while crossing. The Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties is tasked with investigating any complaints of abuse by Homeland Security and U.S. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal confirms they are looking into the issue. More than 60 Iranian Americans and some Canadian, uh, Iranian Canadians were detained for up to 12 hours at the Blaine Crossing this past weekend. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says no one was detained because of their background and the delays were due to staffing issues. To a shocking story now, a man and his 12-year-old granddaughter handcuffed at a downtown Vancouver bank. The indigenous grandfather claims he was racially profiled when trying to open an account. Angela Sterrett's been working on this story today. Angela, so take us through what happened here. Yeah, so Maxwell Johnson just wanted to open up an account so he could e-transfer funds to his 12-year-old granddaughter when she traveled for basketball games. But during the appointment at the Bank of Montreal in downtown Vancouver, an employee questioned the pair's identification, their government-issued Indian status cards. Now, about 30 minutes in, the two noticed police coming towards them. Uh, then police have corroborated that they, the police, the Vancouver Police Department, took them outside to their cruiser, handcuffed them, and read them their rights. She was just standing there with uh, handcuffs on, and you could just see how, how uh, like, she was crying. Now, Maxwell also suffers from panic disorder, and this situation has elevated his anxiety, made him fearful of police and banks. It was really hard to see that my granddaughter being cuffed and both of us taken out of a bank, and it was just really hard seeing. I was just more worried about my son and my granddaughter at that when that was happening to us. Okay, so Angela, we know the bank has apologized. What is the VPD saying? Yeah, the, the Vancouver police called the situation regrettable and has apologized. Police say they responded to calls from the Bank of Montreal um, that there was a fraud in progress and that there were two suspects at the bank. They say the decision to handcuff someone is at the discretion of the officer on scene. Now, BMO has sent two statements to CBC. The first was on Tuesday. That statement said that although there were some mitigating circumstances, circumstances, BMO does not excuse the way it handled the situation. It also says they deeply regret what happened. Now, the second statement that was sent and posted to social media today after widespread criticism online is more specific to the Indigenous community. It says the bank deeply regrets this and unequivocally apologized, adding it is reviewing what took place and is learning from the situation. Now, as I mentioned, there's been widespread criticism about this online. A lot of people are calling for the employee who called the police to be fired. Others want accountability from the Vancouver Police Department. The national chief of the Assembly of First Nations tweeted that he's demanding answers from BMO about how they plan to address this situation. And I'll mention here that the Bank of Montreal will only say that the actions of the employee or employees who made this call have been, quote, addressed. And as for Maxwell, he says he will now launch or look at a human rights case charging the bank and possibly the police for racial profiling. All right. We'll certainly follow this in the days ahead. Thanks, Angela. Angela Sterrett reporting tonight. A Vancouver police sergeant has been ordered to be fired after findings of misconduct. The Office of the Police Complaints Commissioner says Sergeant David Van Patten was in an appropriate relationship, inappropriate rather, with a junior officer. Constable Nicole Chan, who took her own life in 2019. The investigation took more than a year. Van Patten can ask for a review of the decision. A statement from Chan's family says they are satisfied with the order to fire Van Patten, but they do have concerns about the events leading up to the young officer's death. They say the termination represents one step in our ongoing efforts to get justice for Nicole. More needs to be done to hold those who abuse their power accountable. And for Nicole's friends and family, this issue is far from resolved. BC's police watchdog is investigating a dramatic crash in Surrey Tuesday evening. At about 9.30 on 104th Avenue near 160th Street, a vehicle drove through the intersection and flipped several times. One person was rushed to hospital with what are believed to be serious injuries. 
RCMP say an officer was trying to pull the driver over at the time of the accident. Now the IIO is trying to determine whether police actions are linked to the driver's injuries. A convicted child killer has been released on bail after more than 36 years behind bars. Philip Tellio was in jail after 22-month-old Dalavina Mack suffocated during a sexual assault at a party in Bella Coola in 1983. Tellio is appealing his conviction and has long maintained his innocence. The judge who released him says she was confident the supportive housing society supervising Tellio in Abbotsford would provide sufficient oversight. His appeal will be heard later this year, but the family of the toddler says they're devastated by this. Opponents of a massive natural gas pipeline in northern B.C. rallied today as concerns on both sides increase. Those opposed to the Coastal Gas Link project made themselves heard in Prince George today. What Suet and Hereditary Chiefs recently gave an eviction notice to the company. Meanwhile, the RCMP says trees along a service road are a safety hazard because some were partly cut and the wind could topple them without warning. The force has since posted an order on the road giving opponents 72 hours to clear the way before the company is allowed to clear any barriers. Um, a little bit of government hypocrisy. The NDP had mandated to put UNDRIP into legislation, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Article 10 is that we do not remove Indigenous peoples from their territory. Even with such mandate, the government is still allowing RCMP to remove Indigenous people from their territory. They're also talking about peaceful protests, and now it's all just feeling like the government and our uh, private industry are fueling RCMP. The Coastal Gas Link Pipeline would carry natural gas from northeastern B.C. to the coast. A crisis of leadership in a small town fire department has come to an end. The embattled Bowen Island fire chief is set to retire. It comes after the entire 26-person volunteer force threatened to quit if he wasn't fired. Chief Derek Dixon agreed to go on paid leave in October and has now decided to leave for good. The deputy chief will continue running the department until the new chief is found. Dixon's retirement is effective at the end of the month. Meteorologist Brett Soderholm is here with our first check of the forecast. Uh, somebody's a little happy about what I think you're going to say. <laughs> what? I was going to comment on how sunny it was this morning, Mike. I don't, no, I don't know sure, what you okay. were thinking of. Think in the future. Think in yes. the future. Oh, all right. Well, yes, as we go ahead into the future, it's going to be a very different story 24 hours from now. It's the proverbial calm before the storm because, yeah, if you haven't heard the news already, we are in for some snow, and yes, that is everyone here in Vancouver. We even have a snowfall warning issued for Metro Vancouver, but I wanted to show you how it's not just Vancouver. Much of BC is in this together. Multiple wind warnings and snowfall warnings across BC, mostly for our coastal areas in the far north. We're dealing with wind gusts potentially up to 90 kilometers an hour tonight for Haida Gwaii and places like Prince Rupert. Snow inland, 15 to 25 centimeters there. Tomorrow, though, around Vancouver Island, we're going to be dealing with gusts potentially up to 80 kilometers an hour. And as a result, BC Ferries has already issued some advisories. Be aware of the fact that there could be cancellations in terms of ferry crossings between the mainland and the island. But of course, on everyone's mind, closer to home, yes, that is a snowfall warning that you're seeing there for 5 to 25 centimeters potentially accumulating in that time. Now, what this means, it all comes down to temperatures. Right now, sitting at about four degrees here in Vancouver, we are likely to be going down to about one degree overnight tonight, and that means we're going to be getting into some rain or some snow, and I'll have that full forecast when I come back. Okay, Brett, we'll talk to you then. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, we're in a region where houses are pretty unaffordable for a lot of people. Yes, so uh, free sounds pretty good, <laughs> uh, but a free heritage house comes with a bit of a catch. This is the Cooper House. It was built in 1908. And yes, it could be yours if you've got a place to put it and $100,000 to get it there. The North Shore Heritage Preservation Society hopes the house can be relocated. It's working with a developer who wants to replace it with a duplex. The 1,800 square foot home on East 9th Street is well maintained and was originally built for a butcher's family. It does look well maintained. You often see those houses and they are, some of the older ones are a little bit 
They need a little bit of work. No, this oh, one looks okay. great. This one looks great. No, this looks fantastic. Somebody uh, may well I take it up. I think it'll happen. Ship in and make it make it happen, exactly. And we'll update you mm -hmm. once we find out. And uh, a reminder now, you can uh, watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. It's a free app, or you can also find other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Just to add tonight, more on the crash of Flight 752 in Iran. The investigation, the political fallout, and the reaction in Ukraine. That's all next. Well, thank you for staying with us online, where we are ad-free during what's normally the TV commercial break. Yes, our coverage of the Iran plane crash continues right here. We've uh, focused mainly on the victims uh, from here in B.C., but many communities in nearly every province have been impacted to some degree. Particularly in Alberta, which lost 31 people, many of them from Edmonton. Erin Collins has the story of a mother and two daughters who shared a passion for helping others. The snapshots capture moments of lives well lived, bright futures now cruelly snatched away. This was her sister and her mom, as far as graduation. Daniel Goetz Esfahani has lost the love of his life. He and Saba Sadat together for three years, now separated forever. You know, anything I do reminds me of her. Like, I can't believe she's gone. Shakofei Shupanajad was Saba's mother. She was a doctor committed to healing others at this Edmonton clinic. I, I remember her she's a, as a friendship, as a colleague. I will not forget her, you know, in my life. I will not forget her. Both of her daughters, Saba and her sister, Sara, wanted to follow in their mother's footsteps. Sara Sadat was in school to become a clinical psychologist. Saba wanted to become a medical doctor like her mother. She had already applied to go to medical school. While she waited to learn how to heal people, she was already committed to helping them. Volunteering to help families in need with a local charity. And she was trying to help them get above that poverty line and bring them back to their feet. So I think she has touched so many lives and doing medical research into women's health at the University of Alberta. She would have been a rock star. So she, I, that girl would have, I don't know what she would have done, and I wish we all could have seen and benefited from her. Their loss is felt more deeply by their loved ones, but it's one that leaves this city, this country, much poorer too. It's very difficult to see that she's no longer here because, you know, they were all, they were all angels in my eyes. Aaron Collins reporting from Edmonton. We're hearing so many stories of... Um... Yeah, I mean, the numbers are, are, are staggering, but you're right. Every, many communities in our country are affected by mm -hmm. this terrible crash, which we will have uh, more on, uh, the investigation and the fallout uh, in just a few moments. Stay with us. Go back to our top story tonight and the deadly plane crash in Iran. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is confirming U.S. and our own intelligence shows Flight 752 was shot down. As Hannah Thibodeau tells us tonight, he says it's highly likely the plane was accidentally brought down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. After another day of calls with world leaders, allies and intelligence officials, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his national security team address Canadians for the second time in 24 hours. The news will undoubtedly come as a further shock to the families who are already grieving in the face of this unspeakable tragedy. The evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. Trudeau says he has enough evidence of a missile attack 
but not enough yet to say it was more than a mistake by Iran, or what role the tensions between the U.S. and Iran may have played in the tragedy. I think it is uh, too soon to be drawing conclusions or assigning blame or responsibility in whatever proportions. Right now, our focus is on supporting uh, the families that are grieving right across the country and providing what answers we can uh, in a preliminary way. Getting answers for the families could prove difficult. Canada cut diplomatic ties with Iran in 2012, but Trudeau says Iran has indicated it would be willing to issue visas to consular officials who are on their way to Tehran to support the families. The PM says he's been told the two black boxes that were recovered from the wreckage will remain in Iran, but Ukrainian investigators will have access. And Trudeau says that the Ukrainian president has assured him that Canada will have a role in the investigation. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. And word this evening, Canadian investigators will be heading to Iran. The Transportation Safety Board issued this statement. The TSB has been invited by the Aircraft Accident Investigation Bureau of the Islamic Republic of Iran to attend the accident site. The TSB will be working with other groups and organizations already on site. The board also extending its condolences to families and loved ones who those who were killed aboard Flight 752. This crash has made the already volatile standoff between the United States and Iran far more complicated. As Katie Simpson reports, with intelligence showing that Iran shot down the Ukrainian passenger plane, ongoing tensions may ramp up. New video shows the moment the plane was struck. Intelligence officials believe this is the aftermath of an Iranian missile striking a Ukrainian passenger plane shortly after takeoff in Tehran. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, it was flying in a pretty rough neighborhood, and somebody could have made a mistake. President Donald Trump called the crash tragic, with all signs pointing so far to this being an accident. It would be an outrage of truth. What I would do if I were the president, I'd reach out, send my condolences to the uh, Canadian people and to the Prime Minister, and try to rally the world around the idea that uh, we shouldn't accept 40 more years of state-sponsored terrorism. We're not the bad guy here, it's the Ayatollah. The apparent strike took place shortly after Iran fired 16 ballistic missiles at U.S. military bases in Iraq. American news networks say the errant missiles likely came from Iran's anti-aircraft missile system, which was operating after that launch. Tehran targeted U.S. troops in retaliation for the American decision to kill Iran's most powerful military general in a drone strike. In our view, uh, the president, the administration conducted a provocative, disproportionate airstrike uh, against Iran, which endangered Americans, and did so without consulting Congress. Washington is divided, mostly along partisan lines, over the escalating tensions in the Middle East. Democrats are trying to limit the president's military options through a resolution in Congress, though it will likely be defeated in the Senate. What happens next could largely depend on what investigators discover about the crash. American authorities have now been invited to help out in that investigation after Iran originally rejected offers of help. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And in Ukraine, a growing memorial at the airport in Kiev. CBC's Chris Brown has just arrived there, and as he tells us, despite declaring today a national day of mourning, the Ukrainian government is walking a fine line as it tries to get to the bottom of what happened. Kiev's airport, where the Ukrainian flight crew was based, has been the scene of much heartache. Ivan Hapachenko must have been here for half an hour in tears. His son Volodymyr was the pilot. He loved his work like he loved the sky, like I loved him, he told us. Earlier in the day, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was here as well, laying flowers before he addressed the nation. We will surely find out the truth, he promised. As relations with Iran are extremely poor, with most of those countries affected, including Canada, Ukraine's president is a key go-between. A team of 45 Ukrainian investigators arrived in Tehran overnight, including some 
who investigated the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 over eastern Ukraine almost six years ago. Overwhelmingly, the evidence in that incident pointed to a Russian Buk missile fired from the ground. It's what blasted the jet out of the sky, killing 298 people. But the belief now that this crash could again have been caused by a missile has put Zelensky in a difficult position because his teams on the ground require Iranian cooperation. Speaking at the UN, Ukraine's deputy foreign minister reiterated that Iran can't be allowed to hide anything. Our experts must receive unconditional support for their investigation into the inc incident. Among those we met here today was a woman who said she was friends with everyone on the flight crew. She said one flight attendant was three months pregnant, another was looking to start a family, and in her estimation, she believes the pilot of the plane was a hero because as it crashed, she says he would have steered the plane away from homes on the ground and saved many lives. Chris Brown, CBC News, Kyiv. Vigils tonight happening across the country to remember the lives lost in the plane crash in Iran. After the break, we take you to UBC where hundreds have gathered to pay their respects.
Some of the stories we are following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. All Canadians want answers. I want answers. That means closure, transparency, accountability, and justice. New video appears to support what Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and intelligence sources are saying about the deadly crash in Iran. A surface-to-air missile brought down a passenger jet, killing everyone on board. Shocked, and I don't know how to react. And I'm just—I can't believe that people, some people, would do that to their own people. Shock and anger at the latest revelations from relatives and friends of the crash victims. 14 people from BC were killed. She was crying, and you can see how scared she was too. Demanding answers after an Indigenous man and his 12-year-old granddaughter were handcuffed by police at a downtown Vancouver bank. They were just trying to open a bank account at BMO, and the grandfather claims they were racially profiled. Flags in front of the North Vancouver Library at half-mass tonight. The city home to much of B.C.'s Iranian population. To hear from those affected by this week's deadly plane crash and those offering support, the CBC's The Early Edition broadcast from the North Vancouver City Library this morning and invited the public to join. The only remedy I, I can um, say is love and care. The lead pastor at Emmanuel Last at night, community members held a candlelight vigil outside of a bakery whose owner lost his wife and daughter a special memorial will be held on Sunday at the Emmanuel Iranian Church. Uh, I'm deeply saddened by the news and I, I'm in shock. Like many other people in my community, I'm in total shock and grieving for the lost lives of Iranians. I have to come here to support our community because we lost a lot of people, a lot of uh, friends, a lot of um, people who, uh, who were involved in the community. This is very important for me. I so admire people who uproot their lives, come to a new country, work really hard, contribute so much to the strength of this country, and then this has to happen. So I'm uh, expressing my support, I guess, for, for the community. And vigils are being held right across the country tonight. Everybody, like, is somehow affected. In Toronto, a civic center was packed with those from within the Iranian community and beyond it. In Montreal, lights lit outside Concordia University for lives lost. At McMaster University in Hamilton, a quiet farewell for two friends who died in the crash. A mosque in Bedford, Nova Scotia, filled with mourners lending strength to a surviving husband. And on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, amid the crowds gathered, tender moments. And of course, people are mourning here in Vancouver as well. Our Andrea Ross is live at UBC, where students, staff, friends and family have gathered to remember the victims. So, Andrea, how are people there uh, honoring those who they've lost? Well, we're just outside the room right now, but there's a somber and quiet ceremony happening behind me for two former but very well-loved students. And uh, you can tell because it's, it's, the room is full. There's people trying to come in and there's no seats left. This is for Mohammed Hossein and Zainab Asadi Lowry. They were brother and sister. So the people we spoke to today about them, they said that the two had actually moved to Toronto a year and a half ago. Uh, Mohammed Hossein had actually gotten a full ride scholarship to the University University of Toronto for a uh, MD a PhD program it was apparently very hard to get into and uh, one of his friends actually says he was a, a huge hugely bright mind and it's a devastating loss for for Canada's uh, medical community we lost two treasures and from their impact in their communities to their impact in the realm of global health policy and raising youth awareness about uh, the key issues young people face in Canada, I think we really lost um, two people at the forefront uh, and on the front lines. And so it should be a day of sorrow for all of Canada. 
And Andrea, the vigil there at uh, UBC tonight isn't the only one happening at a, a BC university. It's not, no. So there were four alumni from UBC who were killed in this crash, but there was also a student at the University of Victoria who was killed, and I understand that there was a vigil there tonight for her. Um, here's how that community is grieving Roya Omid Baksh. Some of them are shocked. Some I talked to, uh, all of them are sad, and some of them are really angry of the situation because they, despite of what has been the cause of this uh, tragedy, the, it could be prevented. So in that room behind me, again, a standing room only full of mourners, um, clearly feeling these huge losses to BC's academic community. Anita, Mike. All right. Thanks uh, very much, Andrea. Andrea Ross live at the vigil at UBC tonight. Let's go now to more stories of lives lost. CBC spoke with three people, two colleagues and a friend. Each touched by people who died on that flight, each putting a story to the faces of those they held dearly. My name is Merdad Aryanejad, and I'm friends with uh, Parinaz and Iman Wadarpana. Parinaz and Iman were a young couple uh, who were deeply in love. They were passionate about life. I can describe them as a very happy couple. They wanted to let the world know uh, they have an ancient culture that they would like to share with the world. Both of them were really positive, and in any meetings or gathering where Parinaz uh, was present, you could tell that she actually gives everybody energy, and, and she was very kind. My name is Dolores and Sahar and I were colleagues. We were together for five years. So we were in touch every day for one reason or another. I think of her almost like a younger sister because she was very young and bright and vibrant and sharp and witty and funny. She had these big eyes, these really big eyes with the longest eyelashes and she was always so well put together, fashionably coordinated. And we used to make fun, uh, friendly fun, because she will always wear high heels. And we knew it was a hard coming because she will take, 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 take her way into the office. So um, she went to Iran on a, on a family vacation and um, she left at the beginning of December. So the, this was a big event and they all went together, uh, but they, don't, they didn't come back together. It's just too difficult to comprehend such loss. My name is Daryl King. I was Susan's boss and friend, co-worker. Susan was a young lady. She looked after herself, nice husband. She had a 14-year-old stepson from him. In fact, he doesn't even know about that she's been passed away. Susan was sort of shy. She would be there to help. You know, being a personal trainer and uh, a nutritionist means you're a caring person most times out of not. And, and, you know, now to be a realtor, which was now her chosen field, you're always out there to help other people. She was a nice person to be around. I mean, and, and, and she wanted to learn. She was just at that level now, just ready to, like, really expand her wings and, and fly.
Well, it's a simple truth. It is winter in Canada and there is snow. Yes, even occasionally in Vancouver, Mike. Yes, maybe even tonight. And here's another simple truth. Whenever it does snow, there will be a reporter outside doing a story about yes, it. Yes, and now CBC Newfoundland's Zach Gowdy digs deep into TV coverage of snowstorms. Take a look. We get a lot of snow around here, so in the news, we do a lot of snow stories. What's it like out there now, Zach? Wet and windy. <laughs> oh, John, the city was just buried. Well, we got a real double whammy. The snow that's falling, and there's plenty of it, is not going to be letting up. Ryan said these high winds are going to keep up. Woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, was he ever right? The, uh, but while every snowflake is unique and special, every snow story is kind of the same. First up, you gotta have your shovelers. A bit of exercise, a change from a walk in the morning. It's getting a bit heavy now. <laughs> but you want to shovel too much, you end up with a heart attack or something. <laughs> Next, you'll probably see some people walking, looking really miserable. Hopefully, somebody wipes out. There you go. Then we'll probably throw in a clip of a snowplow driver. As you clean it away, it blows back in, right? So can't really get ahead of it. And you can always wrap it up with some cute kids. I was like, hmm. I was shoveling driveways and I made $80. I just like to play outside, that's pretty much it. But sometimes cute won't cut it, so then we start scraping the barrel and break out the props. My wind meter is uh, showing a wind speed of 22 and a half kilometers an hour. Wind meter is a good one, but you can't do that every time. So then we get a little desperate and grab like maybe the bathroom scale. All right now, she's hanging out, she's 21. Or maybe the measuring tape. But I don't know, it's almost four feet on this side. And every once in a while, we actually come up with something original. Everybody loves ice skating, but no one wants to do it on the sidewalk. But for the most part, if you've seen one snow story, you've seen them all. But hey, it's gonna snow again, and I'm gonna do this story again, and again. And when you live in a place where snow dominates your life six months of the year, that's kind of the way it is. Like this guy said. Oh, you just get upset. You got to learn to love it. Live St. John's. John's. I'm Zach out here, here now. now. <laughs> and it's supposed to snow here soon. It is. So, so you better be out there. I know. <laughs> I may end up being there. Well, there. we've knows? got a little challenge for you. Okay. Mm. I want to show you. This was me a few years back. No way. So wow. now you got to beat that. Wow, that is going to be tough to beat. <laughs> I love it. Was this the time you had mentioned before you got snowflakes like stuck yeah. to your eyelashes? Yeah. Was that it? That actually but does this look is, kind I of love painful. this. Yes. So I want you, okay. if this happens to us, which it probably won't, we're not going to we'll get see. that much. We'll snow. see. So even if you have a hood, yeah. take don't it take it off for dramatic effect. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to dive into all of these details for you because it is a tricky forecast admittedly but let's start off by looking at the beauty that was this morning did you get out there to enjoy it it was beautiful sunshine everywhere as far as you could see for the first couple of hours what a nice change of pace to see that sun for the first little while not gonna last long in fact it's not coming back for at least another 24 hours but I need to walk you through this forecast if you are going to get your eyes checked, you know, sometimes they put a lens in front. Do you like the first one or the second one? That's largely what this forecast is going to be because this could go one of two ways. In general, we are looking at snow accumulating throughout, say, 4 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock in the morning. Pretty well everywhere here in blue. From downtown Vancouver all the way to Abbotsford, yes, you are likely to be getting some snow. As the day goes on, it's going to be changing over into rain if all goes as planned, and then it'll all just kind of melt. But here's the second version to that story. It is entirely possible that instead we are going to see snow go all the way down to Delta, all the way over into the Fraser Valley, and throughout the day, it doesn't change over. Isn't this a little bit more scary for some people? I know Anita and I would probably like this. However, there's no guarantee about either of these solutions. So that means it's likely going to be something in the middle. In terms of the snowfall accumulation, what I like here about the first version is that we're likely not to see much accumulate in downtown Vancouver, but this really nicely matches the terrain, potentially up to five, maybe 10 centimeters. But the other option, as I showed earlier, well, this means that potentially there is the chance for 10 to maybe even 
even 20 centimeters of snow. So it's not an easy forecast. This is gonna be a very difficult day, but one thing I do have confidence in, no matter what, the strong winds. The potential is there for some ferry cancellations. We're gonna be seeing southeasterlies potentially cracking 80 kilometers an hour along the Strait of Georgia. That is going to make for some tricky travel all in all and it's not going to end there. When we look ahead into our long range forecast, there's a lot to take in here. So we know that for Saturday, the sun should likely come back. We might be dealing with a few lingering showers first thing in the morning. Come Sunday, however, temperatures barely getting up to about two degrees, a mix of rain and snow, and then say goodbye to above zero temperatures. We're gonna be going down below freezing. That means if we do get snow come Monday, it's gonna be sticking around, and these could very well be some of the coldest temperatures that Vancouver has seen in many, many years. And that trend is gonna be continuing all the way through next week. So if we don't even get the snow tomorrow, just wait till Sunday and Monday, and I'm pretty confident we'll get some then. All right, we shall see. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. Well, team building comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes, from scavenger hunts to trust falls but one vancouver company is taking a different approach agreeing to go vegan for one month as jesse johnson of our cbc vancouver impact team explains the plan is to track how the diet affects their health lay it on your back get in the holder when you work at a medical clinic and you need it. Yeah. Yeah. this is what team building looks like keep together Eight employees at Dr. Raj Atariwala's MRI Center are going vegan for a month. But first... All right, all set. Here we go. A series of tests to check their body mass index, peripheral fat, and visceral fat levels. It's more of an experiment on, I guess you can, you know, in the San Francisco area, people call this like body hacking. Um, see what it does. You know, everybody's body is, behaves differently. Um, and so we have the tools to be able to, to see what's, what's going to happen and how things are going to change. And then here on the inside of the abdomen, you actually have all of the visceral fat. The hope is switching to a vegan diet will cause a Wallace's visceral fat level to drop. That's the dangerous kind of fat that can lead to deadly heart problems. Get you to take a breath in. Erica Ferreira. Blow it all out. Is also participating in Veganuary. Breathe normally. Yep, Veganuary. She's curious about how a radical shift in eating habits will change the way she feels. For me, it's a big energy thing. Um, I'm pretty active already, so I want to see if the vegan diet can sustain uh, me and how realistic it is. <laughs> oh yeah, you guys make up for it. At the clinic where everyone's getting tested, Dr. Ali Farahani says going vegan can be healthy if you maintain a balanced diet and avoid gorging on bread. It's probably hard for a lot of these guys to pull it off because their source of protein usually comes from meat and it's easy to do that. You just eat a piece of steak, but now you're gonna have to find alternative sources for that. So uh, we'll see how they do. For Atari Walla, quitting steak isn't the problem. His weak spot is something sweeter. What's the food you're gonna miss the most? Chocolate. <laughs> With that question, it's gonna be chocolate. and. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of worried about that because I know my wife and kids are going to be eating chocolate and waving it in my face, so I'm a little worried. <laughs> a month without chocolate and dairy and meat. But first, a last meal. Uh, bacon, cheddar, cheese, cheeseburger. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and let me just say, I felt pretty bad after eating yeah. that. Quite a sacrifice. Hopefully, the health benefits are worth it. You'll find out in 30 days. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, that burger sure looks good. A big mm. surprise and a lot of questions. The fallout today after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped back as senior members of the royal family.
Australian authorities are urging another mass evacuation across the heavily populated southeast in anticipation of two days of intensifying bushfires. Messages will indicate to people that they are in the fire zone and that if they can leave, they should leave uh, because we will not be able to guarantee their safety. Temperatures are back up into the 40s and fires are once again building to threatening levels. In the coastal town of Malakuta, the scene of a large-scale military evacuation that concluded just yesterday, locals are being advised to flee again. 27 people have died since September and more than 10 million hectares of land and property have been razed by fire. The Queen has asked Buckingham Palace staff to find a workable solution after yesterday's surprise statement from Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They say they'll step back from their roles as senior royals and spend more time in North America. Sounds like a plan. As Deanna Sumanak johnson reports, it's not quite that simple. At the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, where they once stood together, they now stand apart. On the streets of England, reactions were strong. Oh, I'm quite disappointed, yeah. You don't see William and Kate doing this, do you? It's very disrespectful. And also, you can't, you, can't be, you can't be halfway in, halfway out. But in Canada, the country heavily rumored as the place Prince Harry and Meghan would like to live, the reception is notably warmer. Especially if they choose to make their home in Vancouver Island or in Victoria, they will be able to escape a lot of the celebrity culture and a lot of the paparazzi culture that exists in places like London. So I think this is a really good opportunity for them. On social media, other Canadians, even those who said they liked the young royals, expressed worry about the so-called Megxit, specifically that Canadian taxpayers would have to foot the bill if they were to live here. Royal historian Carolyn Harris urges people not to get too excited or too alarmed just yet. Well, even if Harry and Meghan um, uh, stop receiving money from the sovereign grant, that does not mean they would be arriving in Canada or anywhere else without resources. Harry has inherited money from his mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, from his great-grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And any jobs they might find would be heavily scrutinized. If they start endorsing products, for instance, they would be seen as, as cashing in on their royal connections. In other words, there are complicated issues that will take time to work through, to quote the tersely worded statement from the Buckingham Palace yesterday. Today, a royal source said that the Queen, Prince Charles and Prince William all have teams dedicated to finding workable solutions that would satisfy Prince Harry and Meghan's desire for independence and that they were aiming to come up with a solution in days rather than weeks. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. And of course, lots of rumors that they may end oh, up here in BC, yeah. like she mentioned. Wild speculation, not, not a fait accompli by any means, but uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people think that, that they may well end up back here. We shall... Uh... You should hear what's happening in the UK. <laughs> yeah, Our friends over a... there say it's, they're very upset. Very upset, yes. All right. Faced with too much water, BC Hydro dumped water from a Vancouver Island reservoir. Why that rush was a bonanza for kayakers, next.
Still on Vancouver Island, the release of excess water from the Comox Lake Reservoir made for some exciting paddling conditions for experienced kayakers. Wow, uh, BC Hydro is uh, releasing water from the reservoir after three big storms in the area. The river is running at 77 cubic meters a second. That's three times what's normal for this time of year. So these kayakers have paddled some of the biggest rivers on the planet and say this ranks near the top wow. in terms of fun. It can be real zen, you know, you feel like you're going a million miles an hour and then all of a sudden you flip over and it's like you're in a washing machine. I've been waiting for this uh, for a long time. It's, it, when the river's in, it's, it's really a unique jewel on Vancouver Island and in Western Canada. Again, we want to emphasize BC Hydro does warn these conditions are for expert hiker kayakers only. High uh, flows ensure there's enough room in the reservoir for the next round of rain. Yeah, that looks like fun. Those kayaks are the, 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 the mini ones, the right? The really small ones, yeah. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah. Very cool. All right, uh, that's it for us tonight. Uh, we're going to leave you with uh, some images from North Vancouver from uh, this morning. The early edition was, of course, there. Broadcasting live on the Iran plane crash. Have a good night.